So I'm going to talk about your logical models for environmental simulations, a bit on methods and uncertainties. So this is a work, of course, which uh, has been going on in, in uh, our research group here in Aachen. I am presenting, but I will mention, of course, a lot of people on the way who are working on this topic uh, um, and contributed with many essential parts to it here as well. So let's get started. Uh, I hope you all have your coffee. I have mine here. Uh, to look a bit at what we talk about when we talk about these geological modeling concepts. A uh, brief overview for today. In this talk, as I said, uh, the, the format is uh, really interesting, I think. I've, I tried to follow, this is the list I got from Aziar on how this uh, talk should be, uh, the seminar should be structured. I give a bit of an out, um, introduction to, numerical, to, to the numerical modeling part. Um, some illustrating examples uh, to show you how we use uh, the, these methods, these interpolation and modeling methods. I will talk about limitations, advantages of the methods. Actually, I also um, thought I'd talk a bit about the challenges of actually uh, working with an open source code in an open source community. And a bit of outlook um, of the method and future research. Uh, so it's something which, uh, of course, I think is also really interesting to see where this, uh, these methods take us in the future. So let's get started with uh, a bit of an overview on the uh, introduction to the method itself. So what we talk about when we talk about geological modeling, uh, the picture that we should somehow have in mind is maybe something like a cross section through the earth. You see this here, we have uh, just an arbitrary section somewhere. Uh, in Z direction, we could say that we have some sort of an interface here, maybe a folded layer, which was offset along a fault. And if you have this picture in mind, typically what we think of is a scale of uh, mountain ranges maybe, where we see we have here a, a layer boundary. And what does this mean in geological history? There was some sort of a change of um, some sort of a change in the depositional uh, history or tectonic events, which now lead to features in space that we observe as distinct boundaries in space. If we zoom in a bit closer, uh, we could probably observe some features inside these layers. Uh, typically, we talk here about sedimentary structures, maybe channel-like structures as we see them up here. And if we go even closer, uh, you know, you take your, like your hand lens and you look inside a rock or just take a hand specimen, we see that we have some things which are fluctuations, random fluctuations almost. We see pores and grains uh, and we see another type of structure in here. And why is this important to keep in mind? Because actually in all of these scales we had over the, uh, in a sense, the developments of geological modeling, they evolve different methods. On these small scales, uh, and these heterogeneities, this is something where typically we use methods from these field of so-called uh, two-point geostatistics or geostatistics in general. Uh, if you go to these channels, we may use things like multi-point multi geostatistics or object modeling. And if we are on these scale where we look at these boundaries, we talk about typically about structural modeling or trend modeling. Now, it's important to realize that this distinction here is uh, also led a bit to different streams in, in developments, almost different scientific communities. Uh, something I will touch upon uh, briefly, also briefly here in, in this presentation. I would like to mention also that this distinction is not necessarily strictly related to a scale. We talk about mathematical models, which can be used for different purposes and the different assumptions and on a variety of scales. So today we are going to talk though about these large scale structures or these inter these boundary representations and uh, why, what is the idea that we should have in mind. Um, well, as I already mentioned, the important point is that we may have these major points in time where things change dramatically in a geological sense, either on a very short time scale or to some sort of tectonic events. And this is something which we typically observe today in distinct boundaries in, in 3D space, so 2D manifolds in 3D space. That's something which is a very old geological concept, and this is really present in all types of ideas of geological maps as well. And these 3D models are simply the extension of these maps into basically 3D space. Do we have something in the chat? Is it? Ah, okay. Uh, so where do we get these interfaces from? Well, uh, this is, sorry, it may be a bit small to see here, but we have sometimes maybe, you know, this is something which you can observe in nature if we see a, a mountain range. In reality, of course, we are interested in what's happening, what is happening below our feet. And this is where things become now tricky and challenging and, of course, also interesting. Uh, but because typically we have only very limited information. We may have a borehole, like depicted here, for example, 
uh, with very um, with a lot of information, but at a very limited space, very limited range. Uh, and then in between, we try to fill this information with additional types of geophysical measurements, for example, seismic measurements or electromagnetic measurements or maybe gravity. And we use all of this basically to combine this information into a picture of reality in, in a representation of what we think of reality here in this 3D space represented by boundaries, as we can see in here. So the question is now, how do we obtain these boundary surfaces from uh, distributed input data and orientations? And this is, of course, where the challenge then really starts. Uh, let's look at uh, different types of modeling methods before we delve a bit more into detail. Uh, we have a bit of a range of options here now. Uh, one typical choice would be to say that we have these observation points, say for, from drill holes, and what we want to find is an interpolation in this, uh, of this 2D surface in 3D space uh, using these observation points and some sort of an in interpolation function that we can see here, let's say. There are, of course, other ways that we could go ahead. We could say, well, let's start with some sort of a geological history. So let's start with maybe saying that we had initially a sedimentary layering, then it started folding, uh, and we assign um, functions to describe this folding until we reach something that looks like the, the, the picture that we observe today. Uh, there are two ways to do that. One is basically by describing uh, simply a kinematic function to describe these uh, events in history. If we go even further, we can go to something like geodynamic or geological process simulations, where we would really describe uh, you know, the, the initial uh, distribution of properties, forces that act on it, folding and faulting that is happening in this uh, system to uh, ob observe basically a physically realistic picture. What is the point here? But you can say, of course, it would be nice to be all the way over on this side of ge geodynamic or geological dynamic modeling, where we actually consider a lot of physics uh, and these geological concepts. The problem is, though, that in many of these cases, we, it's, it's very time consuming, difficult. It's hard to find initial conditions, boundary conditions and so on. So this is really something which is in practical contexts very difficult. However, if you are on the other side, this is fairly simple to do on the basis of direct observations and if we have a high data density, but it's tricky to include concepts of physics. And that's important to keep this picture a bit in mind. What we try to do is in the end combine aspects of both sides a bit into a, a consistent geological model representation. So we're going to talk today about these interpolation approaches. This is the, these are the methods that are typically used in also reservoir engineering or, uh, geoscient or other types of geoscientific modeling. Um, just would like to mention that we also have uh, developments in this field of kinematic modeling. It's a code, a code called uh, PyNoddy. If you're interested, you can find information on that code also on our GitHub page. Okay. So uh, when we talk about modeling, we also have to talk a little bit about complexity of geology. And um, just to give you here a simple representation, let's say we have a very simple case that we have some sort, you know, we have land surface here, we may have these you know, drill holes depicted. And let's say that we have some sort of a continuous interface in the subsurface of geological, where we assume a change in geological properties. For example, the top of an aquifer or a geothermal reservoir. Uh, in the simplest case, we could assume that this is a continuous interface and um, wherever we would drill, basically, we would intersect it once. And these are so-called, sub sometimes we call these sub-horizontal layer structures. This can be one layer or maybe multiple layers. The point is that they are in a class of what we can call 2.5D methods that we can model these with. Because we have basically at each point x, y in space, we have just one point of this interface and exactly one point. This is a, uh, a system that can be relatively easily modeled using standard um, deterministic spatial interpolation methods like spline surfaces or also geostatistical approaches and something which you can do in any GIS system. Now let's add a bit of complexity and reality and we start with faults. So what happens if we have faults or fault networks? Well, suddenly we can see that, uh, whereas here we may still have this intersection of our interface only once, we now get to a point where we have it actually in here, we don't have this interface at all, we intersect the fault. And we have, of course, these discrete offsets. So there is a discontinuity in this interface. And to make it even a bit more complex, let's see what happens when we have a uh, maybe a thrust fault or reverse fault. 
suddenly we have this interface twice. So we have it in, inside uh, on this right side here of our fault and on the left side. And these are systems that are already um, where these two and a half D approaches may be applicable still if we separate domains in this fault network, but it very quickly becomes difficult to handle. And this is where a lot of the work has been in the last uh, 30 or 40 years, where all these methods in, in geomodeling, geo in the field of so-called geomodeling evolved. It gets even more complicated. Of course, we can make this even more and more complicated. Let's look at something like an overturned fold and an unconformity, maybe like here. We see that suddenly we intersect this interface actually three times there, there and down here. And the, uh, the orientation of this interface also changes. Or we can look at things like dome structures where we have also this interface overturned and we get very complex relationships between these, uh, these features here and the surrounding interfaces. And this is really where we need to look at these full 3D modeling approaches. Okay, so this is just a bit to, to set the scene here. Uh, and now let's, let's talk briefly about ways to actually get these uh, interfaces in 3D. And in order to do that, I would actually like to go back one step and talk about uh, instead of interfaces in 3D, let's talk about lines in 2D. And uh, that's an example that we, of course, all know from yeah, high school or um, basic maths also at university. A question here, this is a circle. And I would ask you now, um, how do we, so we can, we can draw the circle, you know, maybe uh, it's, it's fairly easy, but how can we describe the circle with a mathematical equation? What could we do? Maybe a bit of interaction here, it's early morning, so uh, why don't you join me here in the chat and tell me, what can we do to describe this circle mathematically? What are, what are two basic options? There are two basic options out of a range of possibilities. I'll have a sip of my coffee. What can we do? Is someone joining me here in the chat? Oh, fantastic. Yes, we already get one uh, equation here. X squared plus Y squared is R squared. That's sometimes called the circle equation. That's correct. Is there another way? Thanks, Guillermo. What else can we do? The center and the radius. Uh, yes, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's a bit what the what we have in the circle equation again. Yeah. Yes, fantastic. So, uh, so we also could use a method here in the chat. I, ho I hope you see it all. Have it open. We could say that we describe uh, somehow a, um, a point on the circle, and we describe how it moves when we when we increase a parameter. Let's look at those two options. Well, the first thing we actually need is some sort of a coordinate system. Okay, let's draw a coordinate system here. We have our center point and we have the circle. So now we have these two ways uh, that were also written here in the chat. The first one could be to say, okay, uh, we know that each point on our circle, let's say we start here, we want to now find a way to describe how we move on the circle with a parameter. Let's call this parameter T. And uh, if we are maybe, let's say, up here, we know that the projection of this point on the circle onto our x-axis is r times uh, the radius times cosine of t, and the y value is sine of t. And this is a so-called parametric description of the circle. We, see, we know all these circle functions, trigonometric functions, of course. But what we do is, of course, we describe a parameter with which we basically iterate and walk around the circle and so we can describe each point in our circle with this parameter. Now there is another option. That's something which I'm pretty sure came to most of your minds before. Uh, and we saw this also in the chat before. And this is the so-called circle equation. Now, what does this look like? This is actually a way to say we, we describe our circle not with a parameter, but with an equation. So the equation being x squared plus y squared is the radius squared, of course. This is a simple the Pythagoras theorem, of course. So we describe, in a sense, what we do is we describe a set of points um, this, which, which follows this equation, and this is then our circle. And let's think a bit what this looks like in a more geometric picture. What we do actually is we describe a field. So we have here a field of values. I don't have a scale here, but we see this is increase, increasing radially, so from zero uh, to higher values up here. And then we define one, basically one uh, contour line in this field, and this contour line corresponds to, our, to the points in our circle. This is actually what we are doing, right? So we are describing this, if you want to, you can see this here as a, as a surface, also as a, as a shape in 3D, and we intersect this at one point. 
And where we intersect this, where we have this contour, this is our circle. And this description is so-called uh, is in so-called so-called implicit description of a circle. And sorry. And uh, now we have um, basically these these two ways. So this is important to keep in mind. What we do is here we describe a 1D feature, the circle, by a 2D field. So what we need to do now, if we have a a 2D surface that we want to describe in 3D. We have to describe a 3D field and then we extract a contour in the 3D field and this contour is our 2D surface. Okay? So let's see how this works. I have a live demonstration. I mean, what can possibly go wrong? Uh, if you want to, you can try to follow along. If you go to our GitHub page or if you just type in GitHub CGRE Aachen and teaching geomodeling. Let me get this over here. One second. So what does this look like? I have here a a little example in uh, in Python, a two Python notebook. As I said, if you go to this website, you can you can follow along a bit. Let me get this a bit bigger, even, so we can see these points. Okay. So what do we have in here now? Um, it's a bit difficult uh, to should make these points bigger, uh, but we have a, a couple of blue points. So this is a blue point here, blue point there, and a blue point there. I have these red points down here. Red point, red point, red point, red point. And I have a green point. Let's leave this green point out for now. So what we need to do in, uh, this is now again a 2D example. And we, what we want to do is now we want to find uh, lines that basically go through these points. And these could be our geological interfaces. So what can we do? We can describe some sort of an interpolation function uh, in this uh, 2D space. And then we need to extract the, and we, we want to find this function, of course, so that it actually goes. Uh, so that these points are then aligned along a single contour value. And now there are multiple ways that we could do that. Uh, I have here one implemented. Uh, I'm just going to show you first the field. Oh, okay, and the warning. Okay, let's forget about this warning. But we see we now have a uh, one of this, this implicit field calculated. We can see that these values down here, it's down here, it's flat, and then it starts to increase. So let's extract now uh, some of the contours in this field. Um, let's look at some of the contours in this field. We can see how it's basically more or less flat down here and how it starts to then get steeper and this it show this folding behavior up here. So a couple of things to now uh, to realize when we look at that. Well, first of all, we have actually two interfaces defined, not just one, but two with one field. And what does this mean? If you look at how we, how we construct this field, we extract these contour lines from the field. If we have these layers, there is actually some continuity in space. It would be fairly easy to pick a layer in between to say, let's say, maybe I find one more geological interface that I would like to model. We could pick another contour in between. And another important point is that these interfaces can never cross, right? Because they are extracted from one uh, higher dimensional field. And uh, this means, in, in this case, at least how these fields are calculated, that these interfaces cannot cross. And that's something which, of course, fits to our geological understanding uh, of continuity. As long as we don't have things like unconformities, let's leave this out for a second, but if you have some sort of a continuous layer which was deformed, then these interfaces can never cross. Now we can extract actually one of the interfaces, we can find a value, let's look at one of these contour values. And we could find now, we could iterate down to find now finally our interface, uh, which corresponds to exactly one of these contour values in space. Okay. So this is again a very simple example, um, but this is uh, actually the implementation that is shown here is exactly what we have implemented in our open source code GemPy, just in a higher dimension and just with a lot of additional complexity. But the basic idea is what you see in here. So let's go back to our presentation. As I said, if you like, interested in this, you know, have a look at this. I think it's really important to get a feeling for uh, how these approaches work. And this is always nice with a simple Python example, I think. Okay, let's move on. So a live example here, yes, as I said already. But let's move on now um, to see what is happening behind this method. Uh, again, something which uh, I will not go too much into detail. As I said, the essential idea is that we want to interpolate a higher dimensional field to extract features uh, in space. If we have 1D features like lines, we need a 2D field. If we want to represent 2D features, we need a 3D field. 
So uh, we, how do we do this in GemPy? Uh, it's, of course, as I said, the question is how we get these fields. In GemPy, what we do is we use a so-called co-crigging method. It's a geostatistical approach in this 3D space where we consider uh, interface points and orientation values and we interpolate one field that fits to all of this information in a sense at once. If you want to have some more details on that, this is really well described in Miguel's paper on the topic. Uh, I also have a list at the end of the presentation. So what is it, what is, how does it work? It's based, the idea is actually already fairly um, old. It's a method developed by Christian Lajeunie already in 97 from the uh, Fontainebleau to use that school, the famous school. The principle is, as I said, that we interpolate a global potential field, as it's sometimes called, uh, with this co cricking estimator. This is the uh, equation that we are, in a sense, using to interpolate without going into details here. The point is that we have basically interface points, we have orientation values, and we need to find then these weighting terms, in a sense, and how do we find them, in this case here, using a, uh, the co cricking system with a universal trend. That's a really big topic or almost a lecture series in itself. So let's skip this for now. The point is that we have all of this implemented in this uh, open source code GemPy, uh, which allows us to now generate these models in a fairly flexible and quick way. And um, we can see this here. This is actually a live screencast where we drag one of these points of our interfaces, move it up and down, and we see how this entire system basically adapts in 3D space. We see faults, we see continuous series, and a lot of complexity in here as well. Okay, now I have to hurry up a bit because I see already I'm uh, already 20 minutes in here. So I, I want to stick to my percentages, but it's difficult. <laughs> I see hard. Uh, one point that I want to mention is that GemPy is also an op really an open source project. It's not uh, in a sense just this research code which is out there. We try to build this also as a community and I'll come back to the challenges uh, related to this topic in a second. Okay, let's go to some illustrating applications. Uh, I'll probably a bit, be a bit quicker here uh, just to show you how it has been used and some of the people here may, rec may recognize their own models again. <laughs> this is one model that we created in the Perth Basin a long time ago um, when I did my PhD there. Um, you can see here faults and interfaces. This was for a geothermal study on the range of hundreds of kilometers as you see here. This is another example uh, from southern France, Alès, uh, a model on the range of tens of kilometers. We see the same kind of large scale features and faults affecting these models. There's also, of course, you can go a scale down and that's something which the people here joining us from uh, uh, Switzerland, from ETH especially, will, will recognize. This is a model created by Jan Niederau um, from data from the GeoMol project. Uh, in northern Switzerland, the Aargau region, a permocarboniferous trough for a regional geothermal study. And we can see here, this is again on the large scale range of tens of kilometers, but also combining here a lot of information from different sources. Let's go to a bit of a smaller scale. That's a project here that we have in our backyard in Aachen, the so-called Einstein telescope. Uh, that's a project to find a suitable region for the next generation gravitational wave detector. And we are involved in this project with the deconstruction of a model. And what we can see here on the right hand side is a fault network for this region and actually seismic uh, or in, um, cross section lines depicted and the potential sites for this Einstein telescope. And uh, does it rotate? Yes, we can see a bit uh, how we combine different aspects of information. So geotechnical information, uh, these uh, cross sections and geological information in one in a sense, in a one 3D view. Uh, we also have another big project um, by Alexander Justel here, a, a really fantastic work in the region south of Aachen uh, towards Weisweiler for a geothermal study. And we can see here a bit more on the type of complexity that we can model. This is actually a cross section through the geological model. We can see these uh, fold and thrust belts uh, and a lot of complexity. We can see still some continuity in the layers, but we can see folding and thrusting all adding up to a high, quite complexity in 3D space. So these types of models are possible. But we can also go to a bit of a smaller scale. This is now a study from another uh, student uh, here in Aachen. This is um, a study done in the Münster region, regional geothermal study. And uh, here, um, what we have is actually a model based on a lot of borehole data. 
from the uh, database, the logical database of North Rhine-Westphalia. We can see here these boreholes. And if we zoom in, we can also see the typical problems when we have boreholes, that we have some inconsistencies maybe in the uh, borehole uh, descriptions. And let's move forward a bit to show you how we get basically now this model here of a, a, the trough in this Münster region. Okay, so this was just some uh, illustrative example. Let's now go a bit more into the, uh, the, the topics behind GemPy to show you also a bit more of the potential and the aspects that are interesting for future work. Okay, one important point uh, to realize in, in GemPy, um, as I said before, it's based on this, um, uh, and this idea of interpolation. But uh, Miguel, um, who developed the core of GemPy, uh, in his PhD, he took a lot of care to actually implement this in a way that is computationally efficient. That's something which is quite often hidden to the user if you just use GemPy uh, and download it and use it for a model. But it's something which is extremely powerful and I would like to ponder on this topic for a couple of uh, minutes here. The point is it's implemented in a so-called computational graph. And the reason in a sense it is that it's on, on, its, on its base, it's uh, implemented in a machine learning library. We used, um, when we started GemPy Ciano, this was a library that was fancy in 2016, which feels like very long ago now. Uh, but this was a, one of the first big machine learning libraries. In the meantime, completely overtaken by projects like TensorFlow and PyTorch. But the idea is the same, is that we describe a computational graph. We describe all of our functions in a, in a graph form, and this allows us then to do very efficient uh, backpropagation and uh, what is even more important in our case, automatic differentiation. However, it requires the construction of this graph, and this is done in an initialization step. And if you use GemPy, this is something which you realize this takes some time. It can be a bit surprising at the beginning. Uh, but what happens in the end is that we, in the first step, when you construct your model and you set up your structure, basically your model structure, you have to initialize this graph um, in, uh, in this basically in this machine learning core. However, once you've done this, the updates are very fast. And you've seen this before with this uh, screencast. So you, you move one point, you directly get this update of your model in 3D. Because once it's generated this graph, any update, so any change in our initial nodes, propagates very quickly through this part, through this uh, graph. And one point that is really important is that this graph allows us to do very efficient uh, optimization and uncertainty quantification. And why? Because, as I said, the idea behind these machine learning libraries is that we are able to do so-called backpropagation in, uh, in classical neural networks. But we can use the same idea to do backpropagation through this graph in our geological models and pass information from some observables back to our initial uh, geological information. And I'll show you a bit uh, to what this means. When we talk here about uncertainty, I have actually a couple of slides on this topic as well. I will do it very quickly in the interest of time today. This is also a very uh, talk by itself. Actually, I'm going to give a talk next week uh, at the Geo Karl School for those of you who are attending on, on this topic. So if you're interested, then maybe it's uh, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll skip it here, but uh, interesting to join there maybe. Just one simple point that I would like to add here. What does uncertainty in 3D space look like? Uh, there's a really fantastic study done by colleagues from France, from BRGM, Gabriel Curio and his colleagues they went to one region in southern France uh, for many years and did a modeling study, a mapping and mod geological mapping and modeling study. And so they have basically a fantastic data sets of multiple models in the same region. And what they've done is basically to take all of these models now and look at how they, how they vary. And this is uh, the realization of, of one team of one geological model. We can see here one interface offset by a fault. And now they said, let's just overlay all of the other models in the same section and multiple geologists, multiple models, this is what it looks like. This is just a fantastic illustration, I think, about the aspect that you know, geological uncertainty is something that is really there. Uh, it comes from many, many uh, reasons and there are several ways to deal with it. As I said, this is a completely different topic uh, in terms of the underlying theory and concepts, which I really like to talk about for those of you who know me but in the interest of time, I'm going to skip that all today. Let's move forward a bit um, to this computational graph again. Um, how, how does it look like? Um, as I said, in GemPy, we, we, we start with these model input parameters and our data. These are 
our interface points and orientations and maybe parameters of our interpolation functions. And what we do in this graph view basically is we propagate this information forward uh, to some sort of observation. And now this is where the power in a sense of uh, probabilistic geomodeling with GemPy comes into play. And this is that we can actually describe now these forward models in a sense as a probabilistic graph. So we may have some observations that we cannot include in our initial geological model. Typical examples are observations of a geological unit without having an interface. And we can use this information now to update our initial model. So think of what we can do is we have our initial model. You see some observation, you would like your model to fit to this observation that you cannot include in your initial model. So what you would do manually is you would adapt this initial model step by step so that it fits to this information. What we can do here is now to automate this process and to combine all information into one graph structure and then to automate basically this model updating procedure. This is done over multiple parts now here and I don't have the time to go into each of those in detail. The point is that we can add basically into our graph of uh, functionality also a geophysical forward operator. Think of uh, maybe gravity or magnetics or uh, geoelectrics. And we can use this graph also to perform uncertainty analysis to visualize and to communicate in a sense uncertainties in these 3D models. Just as a quick, in a sense, uh, here, look what, what this can look like, uncertainty analysis. That's actually also a super interesting topic in itself because there's a big question of how you can actually visualize and quantify uncertainties in 3D. Um, when we started this work, you know, I, I thought back then, well, I just going to, I'm just going to take a standard method to visualize uncertainties in 3D. It turns out it's not so simple. So we work quite a bit on what is called uh, information entropy or information theory to visualize and quantify uncertainties. Yet another super interesting topic. Uh, I have some references at the end or if you contact me, I'll send you some of these papers. That's also a really interesting topic. But let's now continue actually to the aspect of modeling and, uh, and geophysics. I think that's something which is really interesting here as well. So what we can do is, as I said, we can use our initial geological model. We can forward propagate this uh, to a geophysical simulation. And then we can get our initial model in 3D geology. But now what we want to do is we want to update our model based on this, initial, uh, this additional geophysical information. And this is what we see depicted over here, uh, where we have these uh, wiggly lines correspond to interfaces, similar to what we've seen before in the study of Gabriel Curio, but now here generated automatically. And what we do is we combine now these models with the additional geophysical information. In a sense, we filter out all realizations of our geology that do not match to our geophysical observations. And so step by step, we converge to a model that basically uh, helps us explain both our initial geological understanding of a region and the geophysical signal that we measure. We can also extend this to uh, other types of uh, forward models. Here's an example uh, from the field of electric, electric resistivity, ERT. Uh, we combined GemPy with a code called uh, PyGimli, developed um, uh, by uh, also Florian Wagner here in, in Aachen. And uh, nah, now I, it's actually, we have this in this, in this, in this presentation. I should put in the, the correct reference in here. Um, but if you look for Pi Gimli online, this is a code doing all types of geophysical forward simulations. And we link this here to ERT. Um, what we can see is that if we combine now uh, GemPy and this Pi Gimli code, instead of getting these uh, typical uh, pictures that you see, which are of a geophysical in inversion, uh, where we have some you know, jaggered domains and some higher values over here, but it doesn't really look like a geological interface. What we now get is a clear interface um, with, uh, which is giving us the interface between two domains with different geophysical properties. Okay, so this is a, just something I wanted to show as a bit of an outline outlook of what we can do with GemPy. Now let me move forward actually and talk a bit about the limitations and advantages of this method. And I would like to spend a couple of minutes there also to talk about issues for all of those of you who work on GemPy, uh, on GitHub. You, you know this picture here, these issues. Um, well, what is uh, GemPy, what is this approach good at? Uh, it's really, the limitation is a bit that we can use it, of course, 
only when we do want to represent these boundaries as representations in 3D space. That's something which may, may or may not be reasonable. In other cases, it may be better to use a standard geostatistical interpolation. But in many cases, as I mentioned, these ideas of interfaces in, or boundaries in 3D space correspond to geological and geoscientific understanding. You can think of an aquifer, you can think of a soil layer as well, you can think of large-scale structures. Um, physics is only indirectly included, but we can include some aspects of um, continuity that I mentioned before. And this is the point, also one of the advantages. It's quite close to common geological thinking. Uh, these ideas are represented in many aspects of geological maps, relative timing of events, and so on. It's relatively fast compared to a full geodynamic simulations, and we can uh, implement a direct link to geophysical data and uh, use it as an input for forward simulations. That's something that I mentioned uh, briefly only here. Um, I'll come back to this in a bit in an outlook. So what are the challenges? And that's something which I would like to be really, I mean, honest about here. Uh, yes, installation, of, especially of GemPy, can be tricky. We know Theano errors, this happens a lot. Um, so currently, actually, what we are doing is a major restructuring effort to make the installation and use of GemPy a bit easier. And one of the uh, core aspects that Miguel has been working on recently is to separate the core functionality of GemPy, so these inter interpolation methods, from additional features like visualization. In this context, also, there is a new implementation coming up in the next couple of months in pure NumPy. And as I mentioned also before, we still work on Theano, this kind of older machine learning library, and we want to implement and extend this to TensorFlow. That's something where we have already prototypes running. This is something which will come in the next couple of uh, months, I guess. But major challenges uh, in um, this uh, entire step uh, in development of GemPy over the last couple of years is really how we take something like a scientific code that turns out to be useful for our research into something that is really suitable as an open source project. And that's really an aspect that I would like to uh, mention here. This is something which is really uh, an effort. And for those of you who went through this, uh, they, they know that maybe. Uh, but the tricky, is actually, the tricky part is that we get suddenly from something which we used in our group and maybe some people we know, we get to many, many different types of issues, starting from, uh, okay, I have a bug in some Theano part of my graph, which is really tricky, to how do I turn on my computer, basically. And that's something which, uh, which, which is really a, an interesting journey at the moment. And it's tricky because especially this long-term support is really difficult for such a project. What we have done, this is also something really on the side here, but I would like to mention that uh, we actually founded a, a startup um, to uh, foster a bit more of developments around uh, GemPy and some better user interfaces, because that's something which we do not do in our open source code. Still, GemPy will always remain, remain open source, but this is really something, this long-term support is very, very difficult. And the big question is, how do we actually grow a community for a scientific code? I think this is really a challenge, and that's why I would like to mention this here so much. It's quite easy, in a sense, to take your research code and put it on GitHub, right? But it's quite difficult to get something which is a, an open source community, where you have people behind this project, where you have people helping each other, in a sense, and implementing and develop, developing new things. This is something which is fantastic if it works, uh, but it's really a step to go there from a, a scientific code. And I really like this picture here from XKCD. Uh, maybe some of you know this comic. Uh, I hope you can read it. Let me just uh, explain this here a bit. It says at the top, this is basically at the top, we have all this fancy, these fancy blocks, which are all modern digital infrastructure. And there is this little, little block down here by you know, a, a, a project some random guy develops in Nebraska and on which all of this hinges in a sense. I think this is a nice picture of showing you know, how, how we are also relying, we are working with open source projects but uh, if you don't have a community supporting this, it can be very difficult to sustain something like this little branch, which may be quite essential for some other work. Some uh, other note on the side here, actually, just this morning, uh, I saw a LinkedIn um, uh, announcement here by some random guy uh, about uh, GemPy as a uh, tool for uh, modeling and AI in oil and gas industry, which received already something like 1,000 reactions um, and this is just some 
person from somewhere announcing that this is a code that can be used. Suddenly we see an increase in stars on GitHub and we will get many more questions about how to use it. Uh, and this is somehow amazing, but it's also a bit scary at the same time, to be honest. The same thing here is actually there are, if you type in GemPy and tutorial, you will probably be uh, guided to a tutorial session by um, some people called Hatari Labs, I think somewhere in India, and they're developing tutorials around GemPy. So nothing to do with us. Uh, and you see these things happening. As I said, it's, it's amazing, but it's also sometimes a bit scary uh, and quite a challenge to keep this uh, um, open source project alive and active beyond this research code. Good, so as I said here, this is the challenge. Uh, but on the other hand, actually, what is I think really fantastic at the moment, a development which, uh, which really changed in the last couple of years, I would say, is that we see now a really big ecosystem uh, of open source codes and geomodeling uh, around Python and other types of related libraries. And that's something I think which is fantastic, which also gives me the motivation to work on these projects because I think it's really the right time to, to push these open source um, projects forward. I have to see a bit depicted uh, in some you know, parts where we have our Python code as the base, then we have some modules above it. But actually this layer, this layer around here is the one which gets very interesting for us in, in geosciences. We have many, many packages now uh, which are related to either, in, we have Jempai here, of course, we have PyGimli, the one I mentioned before, uh, Rücker is the name now, I remember from the, um, from the paper here, the developers, and Wagner, um, and they actually have this uh, code for geophysical simulation. There's another one called Simpack from, uh, that's from Canada, they do similar things in a sense. We have uh, Fatiando Atierra, another geophysical forward code, so we, and Devito, which is doing seismic forward modeling. So we have quite a range of geophysical codes. We have methods that make working with ge geographical data easier. GemGIS is a fantastic project by Alexander Yuste, uh, who actually also works on you know, developing inputs for GemPy. Uh, we have GeoPandas. So there's a whole range of projects at the moment, and it's actually I think it's fantastic to see these developments and something which I'm really looking forward to for the next couple of years to evolve. A bit of an outlook though, uh, and future research, and that's something which, as Mazia mentioned, is probably also interesting for many people here. Where does all of this lead us to? And um, I showed this graph before, and as I said, I don't have the time to go into detail into each of these nodes right now. But I want to motivate uh, the view in a sense that, you know, geological modeling, as you may know it, if you use one of the commercial programs to do it, let's say, is always this idea that you have your input data, your seismic, you create one model and you use this model for a maybe a process simulation, reservoir simulation. I really would like to motivate you to get, to get rid of this idea. A geological model is never something that is finished or set in stone. It's always a scientific hypothesis, <clears throat> which is by definition, it's a model, so it's wrong. And we all know this uh, nice phrase by Box, you know, all models are wrong, some are useful. And this is something, this idea is something which we have to get into our minds when we think about geological modeling. And what we want to do with GemPy is not only to have some tool for geologic modeling, but to have one, in a sense, one uh, brick in this big picture of geological modeling and geophysical simulations that allows us to combine many, many aspects of information and to find models that are more likely to be right than wrong. And how do we do this? As I said before, a core part in GemPy is its implementation in the graph structure. We can link geomodeling to additional aspects, other types of geophysical forward operators, process simulations like hydrogeological or geothermal simulations. We can link this to uncertainty analysis and any other types of arbitrary functions that you can imagine. And the idea is here that we can basically find a way to combine information from many, many different aspects to, in a sense, automate this process of model updating. And something which I, uh, again, uh, just want to mention here, two small parts. One is, of course, also that we work on this forward operator. And this is an interesting aspect of future work as well, I think. At the moment, there's really, of course, a lot of, like everywhere, people use machine learning to automate some of these processes. I think one really nice example is by Mike Hillier uh, from Canada. He's using graph neural networks to perform this forward modeling step. 
Uh, we also have uh, other types of representations. I talked a lot about these implicit methods. They're also really uh, useful explicit and parametric functions. That's something that uh, Mohamed Mulay Fad is working on. He was also here in our talk today. Uh, and he's been working a lot on actually uh, more complex 3D structures using NURBS and subdivision surfaces. Paper coming out hopefully soon. And uh, we also link geological modeling with these interfaces to um, these structures in between, in the middle, uh, or these properties along our interfaces. So we combine geological modeling and geostatistical simulations. Here's an example by Jan von Harten, where we basically, you can see here, we have our geophysical fields, but they are following our geological structures. Okay. Then we have actually uh, other aspects of information that we include, and one part is topology. Uh, so we work a lot on extracting information from geological maps, for example. That's a work which is done a lot also in Australia by Mark Jessel and his group. Uh, and we are using these methods as well to, in a sense, see which models, which geological models make geological sense. And finally, I mentioned the uh, uh, process simulations a bit, so just as one glimpse here. Uh, of course, what we need to do to take these models now, these geological models, and use them, say, for geothermal simulations, we need to assign rock properties as well. And that's uh, quite a work that we, so quite, quite a part where we invest some time to uh, automate and to optimize these process simulations, also using physics-based machine learning methods, and uh, which allows us then to, co to combine, at some step, to combine geological modeling and process simulations to also see how uncertainties from both fields combine. That's really an active field of research. Uh, we have several PhD projects at the moment in this direction. But I think this was always, in a sense, a core part of our work in, in, in my group. Slowly, we see this, uh, these two things coming together. I think in the next couple of years, we're going to see some very exciting uh, developments in this direction. OK. Uh, and also optimized mesh generation, that's something which is related to all of these aspects of physical simulations. As you know, this is where things become extremely challenging. One thing that I uh, touched upon is this computational graph, and that's something which is worth mentioning. Um, there are many ways, I mean, just this idea itself is easy to say we have one model and we check this against other things, and then we just, you know, filter out these models that make sense and we uh, we, we, we throw those away that don't make sense. But this is a, in, in, in our parameter space with many input parameters and a lot of information, this becomes computationally very, very difficult to do in an efficient way. And we also invest a lot of time to find ways to basically optimize this graph and this sampling of methods, something which is also a bit beyond the presentation here. But we look at different types of optimization methods uh, and, and um, and certainly quantification approaches, for example, using Hamiltonian Monte Carlo and other types of uh, multi-level MCMC schemes. So that's something which is also an active part of research. Again, a bit a look into the future. Okay, so let's now, but now I would like to go to the summary <laughs> before I take you too long. So wait, come here. Yes, okay, summary. Sorry, that was too fast. Why, when, and how do we do this geological modeling? When does it make sense? Um, I showed a lot of examples here in these big pictures of, of structures in, in 3D space. But really, this is a bit independent of dimension. The point is that you can use these methods always when you want to represent instant changes in geological evolution, which are often seen in boundaries in, in, in 3D space. We have different types to, to represent these surfaces. I mentioned uh, some simple 2.5D interpolations, but really at the moment, a lot of work is happening here in these full 3D cases where we have these explicit and parametric methods and implicit approaches like GemPy. And um, the code I, of course, mentioned here a lot is GemPy, uh, our open source tool to do that modeling. And um, what, is, what GemPy does is basically it considers these interface points and orientation measurements but it can also extend to multiple complex features like uh, faults, fault networks. You can use multiple scalar fields to look at non-continuous things like unconformities in space. And we can look at all kinds of geological objects as well. Uh, we have a couple of publications on this topic. I have a link down here. Uh, I can probably also paste this in the chat a bit later where you can download them. Just want to mention that we, we wrote uh, an overview paper on the topic uh, three years ago, Guillaume Comor from Nancy and me 
on uh, all of these aspects of geological models, concepts, methods, and uncertainties, where basically all of these things I mentioned here today in the talk are described in a bit more of a theoretical view and also giving you a bit more of a, um, a view of you know, the different approaches that exist in this field. Okay, now final slide. And that's something, some final words that I would like to mention here. I touched upon this already before. You know, growing and maintaining an open source project is really a challenge, I have to say. Get this picture back in your mind. <laughs> I keep it here. I think this is a really nice depiction of how we sometimes feel. But so, you know, the point is here, if you use these open source projects, and especially the ones which are a bit more on the scientific side, like ours, if you can, then please contribute. Feel free to contribute. We set up a system of, you know, not only issues, but also a way to use pull requests if you have some additions. Don't just go there and rant, this is not working. Uh, it's an open source project, so the point is that it's open, so you can actually look at when it's not happening and maybe fix it, <laughs> if you can, hopefully. So beware of your own expectations. Huh? It's tricky, but it's also rewarding. Actually, I have to say, in the last couple of years now, growing this from Miguel's PhD project, you know, based on our discussions, to something where we now have almost 500 stars on GitHub and, and people writing tutorials about this in, in India and mentioning this somewhere on LinkedIn. This is really something that is fascinating, but also a bit scary at the moment, I have to say. So uh, this is fantastic. So if you want to work in this field a bit, if you want to contribute, especially to open source, have a look at this community called Software Underground. This is a really nice initiative by uh, some people in the US and Canada. Um, it's mostly actually around a Slack channel where there are many discussions around open source projects worldwide. So if you're interested in these things, if you want to see what is happening there, have a look at Software Underground at the Slack channel and uh, contribute if you can. So that's it. Thanks for your attention. Uh, thanks for sticking with me here over time. And um, of course, happy to take questions and to discuss some things in more detail. Recording stuff.